Howdy students! In this chapter, we focus on how science develops knowledge and the role that scientific assessments play in summarizing that knowledge for policymakers. That was all pretty theoretical, so in this video, I'll give you a real-world example of a scientific question we all faced and how we can think through the issues. The example is COVID, which emerged early in 2020. It's important to realize that science can move slowly compared to real-world events. When a novel issue arises, the public can demand answers faster than the scientific community can provide them. It takes time for experiments to be completed, get peer-reviewed, and then have the important results verified in the crucible of science. This was the case with COVID. When it first arose, the experts were unsure about the best way to respond. For example, should we wear masks? In early 2020, the World Health Organization and the U.S. Centers for Disease Control Prevention told people masks were unnecessary. At that time, we didn't understand the dominant transmission pathway for COVID was airborne. Within a few months, however, scientists recognized the virus was airborne and experts recommended that everyone wear a mask. So an important lesson is that over time, as our understanding of the scientific issues improve, our confidence in the science should also increase. Today, we can have high confidence that masks are safe and effective at preventing the transmission of COVID. This also means you should not take the fact that scientists initially said not to wear masks as a reason to doubt the more recent advice that you should wear masks. In politics, people talk disparagingly about flip-floppers, people who change their mind on issues. This is viewed as a sign of moral weakness. But science is different. Scientific knowledge evolves. There are lots of things we understand today that we didn't understand years ago. If your doctor tells you that you need an antibiotic to treat an infection, you wouldn't respond, you doctors used to think that sicknesses were caused by evil spirits, so why should I believe you this time? The fact that scientists are always updating their knowledge is a reason to trust science, not a reason to doubt it. And as the science evolves, policy should follow along. So experts are not always right, but you should still listen to them. Even for novel problems where there's a lot of uncertainty, the experts are still the best source of advice because they're the most likely to be right. For important context, let me tell you about something known as the Dunning-Kruger effect. Psychologists showed a few decades ago that people who poorly understand something tend to overestimate their knowledge. This plot shows a schematic, and it shows that the most confident people are those who know the least about a subject. You see, they know so little about the subject that they don't even know that they don't know. As people learn more about a subject, they understand they don't actually know nearly as much as they thought, and their confidence goes down. I suspect that's what's going to happen to you this semester. You probably came into this class thinking that you know quite a bit about climate change, and you may. But over the course of the semester, you're going to learn there's a lot more to the climate change problem than you probably realize. And by the end of the semester, you will know much more than you do now. And you will also be far less confident in your knowledge because you will have a much better understanding of how much you don't know about climate change. I think the low point of this plot is a third year graduate student. After getting an undergraduate degree and studying in grad school for three years, a third year graduate student has an excellent understanding of how little they actually know. Now, I've been doing this for about 30 years, so I think I know a lot about climate change. However, my confidence is still lower than the confidence of the person who knows nothing, because despite how long I've been working on this, I understand the things that I don't know. The point of this is that virtually all the people who tell you not to get vaccinated even though they're super confident about their position and they may be deluging you with facts and figures, actually have no idea what they're talking about. The facts and figures they're telling you are almost certainly wrong. If they tell you the vaccine will change your DNA, make you magnetic, or make you suddenly find Bill Gates very attractive, they are not actually experts. The people who know, the legit experts, all recommend you get vaccinated. So this leads us into talking a little bit about the statistics of vaccines. First, they are incredibly effective at preventing serious health problems associated with COVID. Second, the vaccines are incredibly safe. Nearly 200 million people in the US have gotten a vaccine, and the number who have died from vaccine complications is approximately zero, maybe a handful. 
For the purposes of this argument, let's say that 10 people died due to getting the vaccine. That means that roughly your chance of dying after getting vaccinated is 1 in 20 million. Let's compare that to other things you do. There's about one death for every 100 million miles you drive. That means if you drive five miles, you have about a one in 20 million chance of dying. Now I'm guessing none of you would think twice about the risks of driving five miles. You do that every day. You also have about the same risk, one in 20 million of death from skiing or snowboarding for an hour. Now you don't think driving or skiing are particularly risky because they're familiar activities while getting a vaccination is not. This is one of the ways your brain tricks you into making bad decisions. Don't let it fool you. Now, let's compare this to the risk of not getting a vaccine. As of the time this video was filmed, COVID had killed more than 600,000 Americans out of a population of 330 million. That means your chance of death is roughly one in 550. Now, those are bulk statistics. Most of you are young and healthy, so you have a lower risk. But even if your risk of dying is a thousand times lower, that still means your chance is one in 500,000. That is still much riskier than getting the vaccine. And death is not the only bad outcome of COVID. You might recover, but only after an expensive and miserable stay in the hospital. Or you might partially recover, but have long-term symptoms, such as a loss of taste or smell or decreased cognitive function. If your cognitive decline is severe enough, your only option might be to transfer to the University of Texas. Now, I wouldn't want anyone to have to go through that. Getting vaccinated is not just good for you, but it has a benefit to all of society. One of the most depressing things about COVID debate is the extent to which people are unwilling to do things to help their neighbor. Here's a video by climate scientist Robert Rohde showing how when you get vaccinated, you protect all of your neighbors. Okay, so this video is going to show what happens with different levels of vaccination in a society. So the green dots are uh, people who have been vaccinated. The brown dots are people who have not been vaccinated. And the red dots are people who are infected. The left-hand panel are, is a world where essentially nobody is vaccinated. Everybody is vulnerable. And then the a number of vaccinated people increases as you move to the right until you get to a world at the far right where 95% of people are vaccinated and there's a very small number of vulnerable people. So let's run this out and see how different levels of vaccination affect uh, society. So if you see the panel on the left, when nobody's vaccinated, everybody gets sick. And you see at 25% vaccination, which is the next panel, um, essentially everybody who's vulnerable gets sick. And at 50%, uh, that's also true. Essentially every vulnerable person gets sick. At 75% though, you see something really spectacular happen. And that is that most of the people who are vulnerable don't get sick. And this is the point where we talk about reaching herd immunity. There are enough vaccinated people that the people who are not vaccinated uh, are protected. And that's even more true at 90% and at 95%. And so the key thing to understand about vaccinations is when you get vaccinated, you're obviously protecting yourself. But if enough people get vaccinated, then you protect everybody else. In the end, almost all the people who have not gotten vaccinated have done the risk assessment incorrectly. They view getting the vaccine as more risky than not getting the vaccine. That is not correct. Getting the vaccine is the safer option. In addition, you're helping out society. And that's what Aggies do. If someone asks for help, Aggies don't give them 10 reasons why we can't. We don't talk about our right to not help them. We just help them. So please get vaccinated. And now, your moment of dog.